earlier. Sure. Well, a good way to, to frame this discussion is to say that every deaf person is deaf in a different way. Every deaf person has a different degree of hearing loss. They may have different causes of the hearing loss. Um, and because of that, they will have acquired language in different ways in their childhood. So some people are born deaf to sign deaf parents. They grow up in their primary language being American Sign Language. So they have very much of an identity as being part of the signing deaf community. They may have very poor spoken English skills. So that's one way of being deaf. And then there's, there, there's me. So I call myself oral deaf. And then I never learned sign language. Spoken English was and is my primary language. So I define myself as oral deaf. I don't define myself as being a part of the signing deaf culture. Even though I was lucky enough to be exposed to it for a year while being a visiting professor on the Gallaudet campus. So in terms of, in my life, culturally speaking, I'm a hearing person with a hearing loss. And I have actually leveraged the fact that I have a cochlear implant to give me a very unusual way of talking about the intersection of technology, culture, and the human body. That's not really a political label. That's really just, it's been my point of entry into the way we talk about technology in, in our culture. Yeah, so you're talking about that, that intersection. Could you talk to us a little bit about uh, your views on where the intersect between computing and the human body are coming together? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happens most dramatically in a cochlear implant. So for most people, the computer is this thing out here. And the human body, you, yourself, is what's in here. There's a very, very sharp division between them. So you know, your body is essentially this inviolable sack of skin. So all the computing power in the world is outside of it. Well, a computer, a cochlear implant, really upsets that whole distinction. So I remember that when I was first talking to the audiologist, the audiologist showed me that cochlear implant with the ceramic casing removed so that I could see the internal hardware. And later on, I can actually show you photographs of that internal hardware. So she gave me, and I held it in my hand, and I saw that there were two little computer chips on it, and a radio antenna on the other side. And I thought, oh my god, it really is a computer. So it's got about 140,000 transistors. So, you know, the 286 I had when I was in graduate school had about 140,000 transistors. So I have about as many transistors per implant as my CPU did when I started graduate school. So there's a lot of computing power in my head. So it really, it was a very profound experience for me to think about that and to realize that I was no longer going to be a person whose natural hearing was aided simply by having amplified, but a person whose auditory world would be created by the computer. So the computer would decide which parts of my auditory nervous system to stimulate in order to create certain percents of sound. And that, for me, hearing would no longer be a matter of just how loud something was. It would be solely a matter of which parts of my auditory nerve the computer decided to stimulate. So it was quite a process, and there was a lot of learning that I had to do. I had to learn the lingo of the audiologist, T levels, M levels, the functions of all the 16 electrodes, you know, all the controls on the processor, what the sensitivity dials in, you know, how, how long the battery lasted. So it was, it was, it was almost like learning, all the learning curve you go through when you get into the computer. You have to explore all the affordances of the software and the hardware. So that learning curve, you know, took a lot, a lot of my attention in the first six months, first year. How customizable would you say that the, uh, the computing device is based on the individual user? It's pretty customizable. So those 16 electrodes, each, each electrode can be individually controlled. So one of the things the audiologist does when you are first activated with the device is he or she decides how much current each of those electrodes puts out. And the audiologist will determine the maximum comfortable level of electrical stimulation in each electrode so that no sound can ever be painfully loud to you. So there's this whole elaborate process called mapping that goes on where the audiologist figures out the maximum comfortable level in each electrode. So that's, so it's almost like custom fitting a shoe to your foot. So the map curves 
depending on the way your inner ear responds to the electrical stimulation. And that's all done in pre-testing before the device is implanted? Or no, no, it's, all, over? it's all done once mm -hmm. it's implanted. So you had the surgery, you wait about two or three weeks for the device to become, well, actually you wait two or three weeks for the scarring to heal, for the swelling to go down, and then you go to the audiologist to have the device turned on. And that is when the mapping process begins. Source of the angiography. Is it say that younger the children can get cochlear implant? The better result, I mean, the improvement it shows. So, as you mentioned, you took the cochlear implant when you were 30, uh, 36 years old. Um, okay, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. I'm sorry, could um, you just? Yes, my, my question would be um, when I reviewed the one source of the angiography, it just say that the younger the children can get cochlear implant. The better improvement the result shows. Mm -hmm. But as for you, you took cochlear implants around uh, the 36 years old, right? When you were three years old. So, do you, so you think uh, how do you adjust to the technology or uh, technology? Uh, don't you think technology should adjust to human beings? Mm -hmm. Well, it's absolutely true 